You making it? Are you all right? You glad to be in church? All right. Um, let's see here. Got uh, some handouts for you. Let's see. Um, yeah, here we go. Miguel, come here. Come here. First off, let me just say I love this young man's haircut. Very nice. Can you make sure everybody gets one of these? Okay, all right. Um, so uh, go ahead and open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. And um, I don't know about you guys, I actually like this time of year because it sort of forces people to talk about Jesus a little bit. And I like that. I like that. There's nothing like getting in an elevator with somebody and they ask you, are you going up? Boy, I, I love that. I get that at least once a day in my office building. And there's nothing like the look on a panicked person's face when they realize they asked the wrong question. Yes, I am. Are you? Well, yeah, I'm going, no, no, no. I mean beyond this. What do you mean? Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Um, all right, First Thessalonians chapter 5. And uh, let me just say this real quickly. Uh, you know, it, you are not as a Christian going to be uh, inoculated from problems in this life. You might as well learn to smile through them. Not everybody's going to like you. Not everybody's going to like you for decisions that you make, especially ones that you make in regards to the Lord or in ministry. Uh, get over it. And I mean that graciously. I mean, just learn that people aren't going to like everything you do, everything you say. And as long as you've got peace with God and you're doing things according to the book, that's what matters. That's what matters. Um, and I've had a couple things come up this last week that would prove to be distracting. You know what I learned? Just smile, man. You know, your attitude being sour is not going to fix a thing. Might as well learn to laugh through it and ask God, what can I get out of this thing? So I'll talk a little bit more about some of my uh, happenstances from this last week in the morning message. But uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I want to talk to you a little bit uh, about uh, uh, what, talk, what the Bible mentions here as quenching the Spirit. All right. And so uh, look down at verse number, uh, let's see, verse number 19. Quench not the Spirit, despise not prophesyings, prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all evil. It's not what it says, is it? <laughs> I'm just making sure you're paying attention, all right? Uh, verse 22 says, Abstain from all appearance of evil. Verse 23, In the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Uh, let me just say this. I'm glad God is not like people. People are flaky, man. One day they're, they're like, yeah, we love you. Next day, I hate you. You know, uh, People change their mind constantly. Do you know why restaurants go in and out of business? Because there's a new thing coming up somewhere else, and people get infatuated by that. And I'm glad God doesn't just go, oh, look, I like that new shiny object. I I'm glad the Lord keeps his eyes on us. Amen. Faithful is he uh, that calleth you who also will do it. Brethren... Pray for us. If I could ask one thing from you this morning, it wouldn't be your money. It would be your prayer. Uh, Brother Sam Gipp just wrote a letter, and he said, uh, uh, this is, he talks about some of the things he's going through health-wise and, and his neck, and, and, uh, and then uh, because he's been taking aspirin for years because he didn't want to get addicted to painkillers, true story, all right, because he's been taking aspirin for the last 40 years, it's, it, what it does is it, it eats at the lining of your, of your stomach. And so there's internal bleeding, and he was uh, feeling like he was having a heart attack about a month ago. And what this guy's, just so you know, you better, yeah, you ought, we ought to pray for that man. Let me, let me give you a, an example of what his week is like. All right. Sunday through Wednesday, he's preaching somewhere, flies back in Wednesday, or maybe it'll be uh, Saturday through Wednesday. He's out of town. He flies from Boise to wherever he's going. He flies back on Wednesday or Thursday. He teaches a class Thursday night in the Institute. He goes back out Friday, and this cycle repeats over and over, and the guy is pushing 70 years old. Um, and, and so you, you put that with uh, fused neck uh, and some of these vertebrae that aren't working anymore and some of the, the surgeries from 2008, about 10 years ago, that are now no longer uh, the thing that they were supposed to do have actually come apart and it's not working anymore. Constant, constant pain. But rather than getting addicted to painkillers, he took aspirin. So now he's got this other problem. And, you know, he, he goes through everything that, that, that has been going on lately. And he goes, now, this is not me whining 
And let me tell you, I've got the greatest life. I could be in hell with my back broke. I'm saved on my way to heaven. And he thanks God for what he's got. He said, now this is where normally the preacher would ask you for money. I don't want your money. I covet your prayers. No amount of money can buy people's time on their knees praying for God's people and for God's preachers. And I'll tell you right now, guys, uh, it is the biggest blessing to me that when I'm going through trouble, I can make a phone call or send a text message and have the entire church pray for me. And I can tell you, I felt it and I appreciate it uh, from the things that I, I experienced this last week. And listen, the things I experienced are nothing. They're just first world problems. Understand that. These are not real problems. They're inconveniences is what they are. Real problems is, uh, you know, I'm being persecuted for my faith. A real problem is I just got diagnosed with cancer. Um, I haven't faced that, all right? I'm not saying that I want to, but my point is this. When I, when I am facing any kind of trouble or any kind of inconvenience, it's a blessing to know that I can say, brethren, pray for me, and there's prayers going up. Uh, better than that, this morning, uh, Sister Rosa comes. She goes, Pastor. She tells me in Spanish. She gives me a big hug. She goes, Pastor, who should we go jump for you in the name of Jesus? <laughs> so that's great. That's a Puerto Rican from New York, right? I like that. Uh, but, uh, but I appreciate that. That's good, all right? Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with an holy kiss. Brother Justin tried that with me this morning. I said, no, no, brother, don't take that thing. I'm just kidding. He did not. I'm just playing. All right? I charge you by the Lord. We'll look back at what that's talking about, though. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. All right, so we're going to try to finish out the chapter today. We'll see how that goes. But let me, let me give you a couple things right off the bat. Go back to verse number 19 where it says, Quench not the Spirit. Now, this is not, uh, we're going to be picking it up. Uh, let's see here. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to start on number 50. You may or may not have that from last week. If you don't have it, that's okay. But uh, in your outline, number 50 says, Quench not the Spirit is similar to what is found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 where you're told not to grieve the Spirit. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. We'll come back to this. Ephesians chapter 4, and it says, Grieve not the Spirit. Grieve not the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4, what is that talking about, and what does that mean? All right, let me just give you simply what that means is you're disobedient to God. When you're disobedient to God, it grieves the Holy Spirit of God inside of you. All right, and that can be manifested in a number of different ways. It can be rebellion, it can be pride, uh, it can be selfishness. But, but in the context of the passage, I want you to look at Ephesians 4 and look at verse number 25, or verse 24. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Do you know what that means? That means that those people that believe that when you get saved, there is no more old man, they haven't really read their Bible. <laughs> Or they're not being honest about what they believe doctrinally. Because if the Lord tells you to put something on, what that tells me is I still have a choice in the matter. And I can choose to... Listen, this morning I chose to select this suit coat, right? And you say, what does that mean? I had a choice in the matter. I could have put it on, could have put a different one on, could have put no suit coat on. But I had a choice. And when he says put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, what that means is that even though, yes, you are saved, your sins are under the blood of Jesus Christ, and there's Christ in you, the hope of glory, you choose every single day whether that's what you put on or if you put on the old man. If you let the old man have victory or the new man. So he tells you put on the new man. Verse 25, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of, other, one of another. You know how you can grieve the Spirit? By lying. All right? Now, little white lies aren't so little, and they're not so innocent, because typically, typically, let's be honest and let's be real this morning, when you lie once, you've got to say another lie to cover it up. Then there's another one, and then there's another one. And, and before you know it, boy, this thing's huge, and you want to retract it all, but it's really hard. Look at verse 20, uh, 26. Be angry and sin not. You know how grieve the Holy Spirit of God in your life? When you're angry and out of anger, you say things you shouldn't say. When you're angry and out of anger, you react to a situation the wrong way. You complain, you murmur. When you're angry and you, you, you take it out on your spouse, you take it out on your children. When you're angry and you refuse to read your Bible because, after all, God did me wrong and I'm not going to listen to him anymore. When you do that, you say, what happens? You grieve the Spirit of God. Now, let me give you a doctrinal distinction between Old Testament and New Testament. In the Old Testament, if someone grieves the Holy Spirit of God enough... The greatest example is Saul, King Saul in the Old Testament. The Spirit of God would leave that person. And that's what happens over there in Samuel. All right. Uh, now, thank God you don't have to worry about that. 
Uh, look at Ephesians 4 and go down to verse 30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. That's the rapture. The Holy Spirit will be in you until that day. However, you can grieve Him. All right? And, uh, boy, this thing can be illustrated in a number of different ways. Uh, I can remain married to my wife, but, boy, I can really grieve her if I want to. All right? And, and listen, that, that illustration can be put in any kind of relationship. You can be in a relationship, but grieve the other party. And so when you're disobedient to what God says, and there's a list of things here that are mentioned. All right, look at verse number uh, 26. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. When you go to sleep angry with somebody, when you go to sleep with unconfessed sin, when you go to sleep bitter towards somebody and you haven't gotten it right, that grieves the Spirit of God in your life. You ever notice that when you've got a problem with somebody, it's almost like the Bible doesn't taste the same and preaching doesn't sound the same and your prayer life just doesn't feel the same? <laughs> Something's off. You say, what is it? You're grieving the Spirit of God. He's not left you. He won't leave you. You, you have that assurance from what you read in verse 30. But you can grieve Him. It, it's, almost like, it's almost like saying, Spirit of God, when you ask someone to talk, and, but you're, you, as you ask them to speak, you're sort of punching them in the gut at the same time. It makes it hard for them to speak, doesn't it? You say, why? Because they can't catch their breath. Something's choking the air that should be there. And they're fighting against someone that's asking them to speak in their life. When you say, I don't know what's going on, God. I'm not sure what's happening. And it seems like I'm not getting anything out of my Bible. And my prayer life is stale. And sometimes it's because you're grieving the Spirit of God by bitterness. And that's mentioned in verse 26. Don't go to sleep angry with people, all right? You say, oh, you don't know what they did to me. Listen, um, I, I don't know what they did to you. You're right. I'm not in your shoes. Uh, but I can tell you this. Any time that I've gone against this passage of Scripture, I've paid for it. And whenever I go to sleep, and I try to justify in my mind, well, this person did this, and, and Lord, you know what the... Listen, it just it doesn't work. And the only person you're ruining is you, <laughs> And you're grieving the Spirit of God in your life, not in the other person's life. It says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Look at verse 27. Neither give place to the devil. When you do this, you're giving place for the devil to work in your life. Therefore, you're grieving the Spirit of God. You're choking what the Spirit of God wants to do in your life. Verse 28 talks about not stealing. I know we've got good people here. I know we've got people here that probably wouldn't steal a car. You probably wouldn't steal uh, somebody else's money. Uh, but you might steal time from your employer's clock. Amen. <laughs> Listen, what I'm getting at is don't steal. All right? Be honest. This is Christian character stuff. Look at verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. You don't agree the Spirit of God with what comes out of your mouth if it's not for the edification of believers. You know, uh, sometimes you can be right and still be wrong. I think I may have mentioned this Wednesday night. You can be right about a position that you've taken, but you handle it the wrong way, and then you move from being right to being wrong. And, and sometimes you might be right about a certain position, but the way that you speak to somebody about it makes you wrong. All right, you say, what does that do? It grieves the Spirit of God in your life. Look at verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. With all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. If you ever find yourself thinking, Pastor, you don't know what this person did to me, can I just remind you, you did a whole lot more to God, and He forgave you. It's Bible. It's Bible, all right? So, uh, again, uh, number 15 in your outline, uh, this is something that can be done, talking about quenching the Spirit, or grieving the Spirit, based on what we allow in our lives as believers. Verses 24 through 32 give us an understanding of how we can grieve the Spirit. Now, let me give you a couple of other things. I was talking with somebody recently, and they asked me, do you believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost? I said, yes, I do. They go, well, you're a Baptist. What do you mean you believe in that? I said, well, let's talk about what that means. Um, it, you know, it's almost like Clinton back in the 90s. It depends on what your definition of is, is, you know, or uh, I don't, <laughs> what is it, the other one? Uh, I do not think that word means what you think it means, you know. Uh, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is not what some people make it out to be, all right. Um, so when it says about, it talks about quenching the Spirit and grieving the Spirit, you can do so, but it doesn't mean that you lose the Spirit of God. So let's talk a little bit about the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, and let's talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. Now, this is not in your notes, it's not in your outline, but I thought it was important because here's the deal. When I come across something like this, I'm assuming 
that if people are asking me questions like this, they're probably asking you questions like this. All right? And if you talk about the Lord to anybody, at some point in time, stuff like this is going to come up. And you need to be ready to have an answer uh, of what to expect. 1 Corinthians 12, and uh, look if you would at verse number 12. For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. All right, the Bible says, He that hath the Son of God hath life, he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Either you're saved, or you're not. You're saved or you're lost. You're in the body of Christ or you're out of the body of Christ. Right? So if you're in the body of Christ, you are saved. You've been born again. All right? The way that the Bible describes what God does in your life, the moment you get saved, and this is what I try to tell people, you don't always, when someone gets saved, they go, was I supposed to feel something? You know, is there some kind of light that's supposed to go off? Or, and I'll tell you, depending on what your circumstances in life, I've seen some people just shed tears, just, no! Thank you, God, for saving. I see some people bow their head and go, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm on my way to hell. They get done praying, look up, they go, That was it, right? Yeah, that was it. You trusted Christ, you shared from your heart. Yeah, I did. Okay. All right. And, and, and so it's not so much about the experience or the feeling, but let me tell you what happens when you get saved. When you get saved, Christ is put in you, and you are put in Christ. Do you understand how that works? The, the Bible talks about the world uh, that then was being in, in the water and out of the water, right? The water was in the world, the world was in the water. Think about it like this. If you get in the bathtub, you're in the water and the water's in you, right? All right, that's just how it works. When you get baptized, all right, it is a picture, the physical baptism is a picture of the spiritual thing that took place. What's the spiritual thing that took place? You were put in Christ and Christ was put in you. So when, when it talks about a spiritual baptism, look at 1 Corinthians 12 and verse number 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. Many members, but one body. That spiritual baptism, let me say this. I'll give you a million bucks if you can find anywhere in that passage of Scripture where it mentions that thing being associated with a second blessing. Some people teach that you get saved, but you don't have the Holy Spirit until this certain experience happens. And, and let me just say this, more times than not, when someone teaches something that's off, they're getting it from the Bible, but they're getting it from the wrong place in time. Or they're pulling something out of context, all right? Uh, so what, what some people teach about the Spirit of God is, number one, He can leave you. Ver, Ephesians 4.30, thank God, shows you He can't, all right? God made His promise, and He's going to seal you unto the day of redemption, all right? So we, we want to get that much out of the way. Well, now let's go a little bit further. What some people teach is, okay, I've trusted Christ as my Savior, I believed on Him, but I haven't yet been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so I need to get this second blessing, I need to have this other experience that gets me baptized in the Spirit of God. Very clearly, from just reading 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you can see that baptism in the Spirit and salvation are one and the same. Because Christ is being put in you, and you are being put in Christ. All right, But let me give you this, because what some people do is they try to go to the book of Acts. Now, guys, let me say this. Is Acts inspired scripture from God? Sure it is. All right. Uh, is it any less important than what Paul writes? No. However, you need to understand this. If you try to get church doctrine in an understanding of, of salvation as it is today, from, from how God administers the Holy Spirit in the, in the book of Acts, you're going to be very confused. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Look at Acts chapter number 2. Go to Acts chapter 2. And uh, I'm just going to give you a little bit of doctrine. I know that the, the practical side of things here is that you're not supposed to, to quench or grieve the Holy Spirit of God in your life by disobeying God's Word, by going against the instruction He's given you. All right, Acts chapter number 2. And uh, look, if you would, uh, if you were to read, we don't have time to do it right now, but if you were to read uh, verse number 4, it talks about the disciples being filled with the Holy Ghost and speaking with other tongues. Now, if you read the rest of the passage, what you find out is that those tongues are not gibberish, but rather languages. They're languages from different parts of the world. And as these people come from different parts of the world to Jerusalem, all right, and the Holy Spirit is given to the disciples as Jesus promised in Acts chapter number 1, 
All right. As Jesus promised in Acts chapter number one, it's given to them and they speak. And, and the people from the Elamites and the Parthians and the Medes, they're hearing the word of God being preached in their own language, even though these disciples are, as the passage says, unlearned Galileans. That's the miracle of tongues. But let me let me show you something that's interesting about this. Go down toward the end of the chapter and look at verse number 38. Verse 38, by the way, is not what we preach today for salvation. All right. Uh, be very careful to point that out. But I want to show you something. And then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. That's a physical baptism. You learned that from looking at the rest of the passage. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now look at verse 41. Then they that gladly received the word were baptized. Now I want you to, if you're taking notes, look at the order of this. They received the word. Okay. Then they're baptized, all right? And you know what happens after that? They're given the Holy Ghost. Well, think about the order. They believe, they're baptized, then they're given the Holy Ghost. Is that what happened with you? I know some people that got saved, trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. They didn't get into baptismal water until five years later. The Holy Ghost didn't come on you when you got in the water. The Holy Ghost came on you when you trusted Christ as your Savior, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But what you have to understand about the book of Acts is that God is transitioning all right, everything from the nation of Israel to this thing that's going to be known as the church. And, and, and what God does is he reveals things bit by bit, piece by piece, like the Bible says in Isaiah, line upon line, precept upon precept. And so the administration of how the Holy Ghost is given is different in the book of Acts. That's one example. Look at Acts chapter number 10. Let me show you another one. This is why if you try to use the book of Acts to show how you're going to get the Holy Ghost, you're going to be very, very confused. You say, why? Because there's a whole lot going on in the book of Acts that from the surface you may not notice. All right? The bigger thing that's taking place is that the nation of Israel is coming to grips with the understanding that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom that was promised to them by John the Baptist and then by their Messiah is not going to happen in their lifetime. And so all of a sudden, that's going away, and what's being ushered in is this thing called the church. And so look at Acts chapter number 10. Look at Acts 10 and verse number 44. This is the, the uh, encounter of Peter with Cornelius. All right? So remember in Acts 2, they believe the word, they're baptized, and then they get the Holy Ghost. Look at Acts chapter 10. You're going to see a different order. Verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Look at that. They don't get baptized yet. He's talking to them. The Holy Spirit comes on them. And uh, do you believe the Bible? Amen. All right, you got to take it literally, right? And so we take it literally. In this passage, Peter is speaking, and the Holy Ghost just falls on them. And then look at verse 45. They of the circumcision which believe were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they, the unbelieving Jews, there's the context, uh, heard them speak, the Gentiles, with tongues and magnify God. Look at verse 47. So here's what happens. They're listening to Peter preach. They get the Holy Spirit. And then afterwards, they get baptized. Are you with me? Yeah. Are you noticing the order, how it's changed from chapter 2? All right, that's, that's unique. That's different, right? Uh, look at Acts chapter number 19. Now, I'm not going to go into why I think it happens in that order right now. But I'll just say this. It's different from Acts 2 to Acts 10. And it's different from Acts 10 to Acts 19. And by the way, let me give you this. Um, Acts 2, 10, and 19 are the only three times in the book of Acts, which is a historical account of the ministry of the apostles in the early church. Acts 2, 10, and 19 are the only accounts of people speaking in tongues given in the book of Acts. And what you learn in every single one of those instances is there are unbelieving Jews present. You say, Why? Because the tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. I asked somebody yesterday, I said, hey, let me ask you a question. You, you said you're speaking in tongues and praying in an unknown tongue? Yeah. In your prayer life with God? Yeah. Okay, then explain this to me. Why does it say in 1 Corinthians 14, 22, that tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not? Yeah. Who's this sign for? Where are they at if you're just praying by yourself? And what is it doing for you? Then in 1 Corinthians 1.22, it says the Jews require a sign, but the Greeks seek after wisdom. You put 1.22 and 14.22 together, and what you find out is that every time that tongues are uh, given in, in the book of Acts, there are unbelieving Jews who God is trying to confirm the word to and show those unbelieving Jews, hey, that guy you crucified, yeah, he was your Messiah. Hey, those people that you say are unclean, yeah, they're going to be part of the same group as you now, called the church. And so look at Acts chapter 19. Acts 19. 
And look at verse number 2. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Now, who's Paul talking to? Uh, Paul is talking to uh, 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 Apollos. And uh, he's talking to this man, Apollos, in Ephesus. And he asked him, Have you received the Holy Ghost? And they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Look at that. Then look at verse 3. You say, Why? Because the last thing they knew, the last thing Apollos knew about, was the baptism of John. That's the last message that he heard. Do you know what John's message was? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Get ready for your Messiah. Well, the Messiah came. He was crucified. He was buried. He rose again. Now he's gone. And the last thing that Apollos heard was from way back here. Do you understand why there's a transition that has to take place in the book of Acts? There's a lot going on in those first 30 to 40 years of, uh, uh, of the first century. All right? Uh, look, look at verse uh, 3. He asked someone, what were you baptized? Under John's baptism, verse 4. Then said Paul, John verily baptized, uh, baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay, notice something else. This time they believe his message. They get baptized. Now look at this. When Paul had laid his hands upon them. No, ho, ho, ho. In Acts 2, no one's laying hands on anybody. In Acts 10, no one's laying hands on anybody. But in Acts 19, for them to get the Holy Ghost, someone's laying hands on somebody. Do you understand why you can't build what you believe uh, in regards to church age doctrine from the book of Acts? So which one would it be? Would it be Acts 2? You know, it's like a game show. We'll look behind door number 1, Acts chapter 2. Or would it be door number 2, Acts 10? Or door number 3, Acts 19? You know, which one would it be? And, and so you, you, can't, you can't pull church age doctrine from Acts. There's a lot you can't get out of it. I'm not discounting the book of Acts. But what I'm saying is God administers the Holy Ghost like this today. And you know this from Paul's writings. You trust Christ as your Savior. You are baptized by the Spirit of God into Christ's body. And Christ is put in you and you are placed in Christ. End of story. Amen. Now, here's what happens. The Holy Spirit's in you. You're going to get all the Holy Spirit you're ever going to get, the moment of salvation. However, if you're walking in the flesh, do you know what you do? Go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If you're walking in the flesh, you know what you do? You quench the Spirit. Verse 19, quench not the Spirit. If you walk in the flesh and you disobey God's Word, Ephesians 4, you grieve the Spirit. Grieving and quenching the Spirit sort of have the same connotation. It's like you're choking something. And you're choking the work of the Holy Spirit in your life based on how you react to God's Word. If you're obedient, you know what the Bible says? Um, go to Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse number 18. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Spirit. Everybody with me this morning? <laughs> all right. All right. Fill with the Spirit. All right. So here's the point. The point is, when you're following the Lord and listening to what He says and obeying Him, you are crucifying the flesh, and there's less of you and there's more of Him. It is not a matter of, okay, after salvation, I've got to have this second experience so I can be filled with the Spirit. You know why I think some people like that idea? Because I think it removes the responsibility from them to do right as a Christian. It just makes it, well, God hasn't given me that yet. No, no, no. You got saved. You trusted Christ as your Savior. You have the Holy Spirit of God. You have everything you need to live right. But sometimes, because of how you react to God's Word and how you react in the flesh to things, you quench the Spirit or grieve the Spirit of God. And the warning that Paul is giving here has to do with not quenching the Spirit. Go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and look at this again. Quench not the Spirit is what it says in verse number 19. Now look at the very next verse in verse 20. You know what's connected with not quenching the Spirit? Number 51 in your outline says, Notice the connection between quenching the Spirit and not despising prophesying. All right? Now, the modern day, we're going to talk about this here. Look at number 52. The word prophesying in verse 20 has to do with preaching. That is the correct Modern application of that word today. All right? The correct modern application of the word prophesying, as far as what that means to the New Testament Christian, is preaching. All right? Let me prove that to you. Go to 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1. And uh, look at number 53 in your outline as you turn there. 2 Peter chapter 1. 
And in 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, look at uh, verse number 16. For we have, now this is Peter talking about his experience with the Lord. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. What he's talking about is the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17. That Mount of Transfiguration is a picture of the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's what Peter just said. And, and what he's saying there is this. We didn't make this story up. We didn't eat a lot of pizza one night and have too much soda and have indigestion and have wild dreams, all right? Uh, we didn't uh, uh, dream this thing. It wasn't, you know, some kind of trance situation. We were there. It, it happened. It, we could touch it. We could tell you that it took place. But I want you to notice that there's something even better than the experience that he has. Uh, look at verse number 17. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. You've got two senses being mentioned, sight and sound. He said we saw it and we heard it. We were eyewitnesses, meaning we were there, we saw it, and we heard it. But look at what he goes on to say in verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. What is that word of prophecy? Look at verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You say, what is that? He's talking about the Bible and how God gave it. And so what he's saying is, listen, no prophecy is of any private interpretation, but God moved through the Holy Spirit in the lives of men to give us the exact words that we need. So when, when a preacher gets behind the pulpit and says, thus saith the Lord, you know what he's doing? He's prophesying from the Bible. And so, and so what, what Paul is saying is despise not prophesying. Now, I don't know, you may not be... Uh, you may be superhuman. You might love church every time you're here. But there's going to be at some point a message you don't like. There'll be something you don't like. You know what he says? Don't despise it. You say, why? It's good for you. Well, I've already heard it before. Hear it again. <laughs> you know? Uh, you say, why? Because he says he associates quenching the Spirit of God. Let me tell you something that will just kill a church service. If you come in with a bless me if you can, preach your attitude. You're not, let me just say this. It doesn't hurt the, pre the preacher, if he's got any sense about him, all right, just learns to do this. You know why the Bible says, be not dismayed at their faces? I can tell you, there have been times, I wish I could put a mirror right here. Because there, there have been times where I'm looking out and I can go, they're not getting a blessing. Oh, man, I hit something there. You know, like, almost like we were talking, uh, me and Miss uh, Debbie were talking before church and said, you know what we're going to do? We got stage number one of the nursery pagers completed. Stage two is yet to come. You say, what's stage two? Instead of it being a buzzer, a pager, it has electric shock factor. <laughs> So parents are sitting there, oh, you know, and, and so it's time to go get my kid. Listen, sometimes when I'm preaching us, if it looks like that's exactly what happens, you say, what is that? I don't know. I mean, it's different for everybody. Uh, sometimes there's something that's said and you don't like it. Sometimes it's, it's a matter of how it's being delivered. And I'll tell you right now, if you want to find fault in the preacher, you'll find it in me. I won't always deliver the message right, but what he's saying is don't despise the message. Not even the messenger. He's not saying despise not the prophets. He says, despise not prophesying. You say, why? Because it'll quench the Spirit of God in your life. It'll quench the Spirit of God in a church service. And, and I tell you, I've been, you know, my wife and I, we know, you guys know this already. We've, we were on deputation years ago as missionaries, and we were in over 200 churches. And there are times where you walk in, and boy, it's fresh, and it's exciting. People are happy to be there. You can tell people have been in prayer. They've been in their Bible. Some of them have been fasting. And boy, it's like there's electricity in the room. Now listen, I'm not one of these guys that lives for experiences, but I'll tell you this. I will tell you there's nothing like coming to a church service where people have been prayed up, they've been fasting, and they've been in their Bibles, and they've been letting God work in their lives because, man, it is something else. And God will move in a church service like that. Let me flip that. There's nothing like coming to a church service where it's dead and it's dry as cracker juice, as they say down south. You say, what is that? Just, man, it doesn't matter what. You could be talking about the resurrection. You could be talking about the birth of Christ. You could be talking about the grace of God. And it's just like, Ugh. Now you say, what is that sometimes? Well, sometimes what it is, is it's just, oh, yeah, I've heard this before. Oh, man, why am I even here? 
And let me just tell you something, guys. I have sat, you know, people think sometimes, you, they forget, pastors were once time, you know, people that sat in the pews, and I sat there. And I wasn't always, there have been times where halfway through a message I'm going, what am I thinking about? Where's my mind right now? What is wrong with me? Lord, forgive me. I want to get something out of this. What a colossal waste of time. Let's do the math, guys. It takes you, I'm going to guess, about an hour to get things ready in the morning. If you've got kids, if you have eight, you just multiply. You know, for every kid, it's this much more time, right? And, and then it takes you so long to get to church. And then you're sitting for two hours. And if it's a really long day, three hours, if pastor's going real long. And to sit there that long, and then another 30, 20 minutes to go home. That's, you know, that could be four hours of your day. What a colossal waste of time if you're going to get nothing out of it. Amen. Despise not prophesying. Now, let me show you this from the outline, number 53. Uh, we see this, this prophesying being uh, the uh, reference to preaching today, from 2 Peter 1, verses 16 through 21. And it says this, where you see a contrast between experiences and the Bible. Notice that the Word of God is superior or more sure. See so what do you mean? Peter's drawing a correlation between an experience he had Literally on a mountaintop. We always, talk, we always talk about mountaintop experiences. You ever been like, you just feel like you're high for Jesus? And I don't mean that blasphemous. I just mean, it doesn't matter what's thrown at you. You're not deterred. You're excited. You're just on cloud nine when you walk with the Lord. And everything's just great. All right? That's a mountaintop experience. We, don't, we can't live on the mountain. We get to visit every once in a while. Amen? And, and so, you know what's happening here? There is a mountaintop experience where Peter's on top of a mountain, and there's Jesus, and there's Moses, and there's Elijah, and what a great experience. And yet, do you know what he says about that? He says, seeing that and hearing that, what an experience, and I was there. But do you know what's more sure than that? Words in a book. Amen. So you know what that tells you? The word is more superior to experience. And that's important to get because there are some people that would say, well, I know this is true from the Bible because I experienced this. Can I say this? It is a blessing when God confirms things through an experience. But if God's confirmation is an experience that goes against Scripture, can I say this? That wasn't the Lord. See why? Because this is more sure than all of that. All right. Now, number 54 says there were prophets. There were prophets in the early church. Understand, at the time of the book of, of Acts, for example, you're talking about history that covers the day that Christ went back up into heaven. That's fresh, man. All right, so we're looking at 33 A.D. All right, and it covers about, oh, let's see here, about, I'd say, 15 years of experience altogether, roughly. And so you're talking about from about 33 to about 50 A.D., maybe a little bit less than that. And so what you have is you've got... Uh, a, 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 again, like I mentioned, you've got a transition where the Bible has not been completely given and God is still using prophets like he did in the Old Testament. A prophet, another name for a prophet in the Old Testament was seer, S-E-E-R. You say, what does that mean? They could see into the future and God would supernaturally reveal the future to them so they could give it to other people. Guys, I don't need to come here and go, guys, last night the Lord spoke to me. And the Lord told me that if you don't give me $5,000, he's going to kill me. <laughs> Some of you go like, amen, praise the Lord, it's about time. <laughs> you know, but, but you know, there's people that do that. They get up and say, God spoke to me. And when they said that God spoke to them, they mentioned something that cannot be proven with the Bible. Guys, be leery of that. Prove all things. We're going to see that in the passage in 1 Thessalonians. All right. The, the point is this. There were prophets in the early church, but... That's because the Bible had not yet been given in its entirety. One example is Agabus, who we learn about from Acts chapter 11, verse 28. Agabus foretold of a dearth or a famine that was going to take place in Jerusalem. And you know what happens eventually? Uh, the Macedonian Christians and the Corinthian Christians give money and send money to the saints in Jerusalem at the hands of the Apostle Paul. to be. A, there's no Western Union Thank God there was no, like, instant money transfers. That's what they did to me in my bank, you know. Uh, you know, there was none of that stuff back then. So if you want to send money somewhere, someone's taking it. And that's what Paul did. Now, Paul knew this. Uh, Paul does this later. Agabus prophesies of this chapters before he ever goes there, years before it takes place. All right? Um, so, again, it was, there was a place for that in the early church. But you need to understand, with the Bible being completed, there is no need for that. 
And you need to be very leery of someone that tries to tell you that God spoke to them and they've got a special message. And, and listen, I don't care what the cult is. Every single cult does that. Well, yes, there's the Bible. As a matter of fact, I've got to tell you this. I was uh, uh, going through the radio station and uh, my truck has HD channels. I don't even know enough about this technology, all right? I just know that it's sort of funky because one minute it's KOSI, which is all Christmas music for the rest of the season, all right? And then the next minute it's the Mormon channel. What? And I'm going, this is interesting. Now listen, I'm sitting there going, this is funny. And uh, I listen to this guy talking. He's talking about the King James Bible. Right. And he's talking about how it's superior to my... I'm going, hey, man, you get him, Brother Joe. Right. Get him. You know, and he's somebody that's superior, and, 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 and it's more majestic in its language. I'm going, yeah, yeah. He goes, and anyways, if you want to find out what the modern meaning of these words are, you just got to look in the LDS footnotes in your King James Bible, and they'll show you what those words would be in the modern translations. Anyway, I go, oh. So in the end, there's another authority that's superior to the Bible God gave you. And what I'm trying to get at, guys, is this. It doesn't matter if it's someone says a vision came to me, an angel came to me. Galatians warns against that. Uh, God came to me. Uh, you know, listen, I understand God might lead us to do certain things. There are times where I might get up and say, you know, I believe this is what God wants for our church. But I'm not saying God came to me in a vision. And he told me if we don't have $10,000 to do this, then we're going to. Listen, that's just foolishness, guys. And it's rampant in Christianity because people don't know their Bible. And they don't know how, they've never been shown how to rightly divide the word of truth. All right? Now go back, if you would, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We'll look at verse 21. Great commandment here. Great commandment. Uh, number 55 in your outline. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. Prove all things. Let me ask a question. Do you guys like to fill in the blank things? Does that help you stay on track a little bit? Um, you can thank Ariana for that. One day she's going, Dad, you know, I like the outlines you have with the questions where we write everything down. But it's just, I don't know, it's too much. Can you just do fill in the blanks? I really like that. I said, oh, okay. So you guys can thank Ariana for that. Uh, but uh, prove all things. That's the commandment. Prove all things, as found in verse 21, refers to executing discernment and judgment over every part of your life and measuring it all by the Bible. Or as they say in the world, measuring it by the book. You are also told, all right, you're told there in uh, verse number 21, prove all things, but look, notice what else. You're also told to hold fast. All right, number 56 in your outline, you're told to hold fast. Keep in mind, this is where we get the modern word fastener. Now, I'm not a carpenter, but I can tell, there's a couple, I can see where there were uh, the nails that were driven in. And what they'll do is they'll drive those nails in, and they'll put putty over it, and then they'll sand it, and then they'll stain it. But do you know what that nail is doing from this piece of wood, that's the trim to the, the interior frame? Do you know what it's doing? It's fastened to it. You know what that means? It's sticking to it. All right? You know what they call glue? It's liquid fastener. Worst thing in the world you could ever do, by the way, I know from experience, is uh, you get glue on your fingers and then go to take your contacts out. That's bad. All right? <laughs> You get stuff sticking to the wrong stuff. There's a spiritual lesson in there, I believe. You know, you don't want to get stuck to the wrong stuff. All right? Uh, but uh, it says uh, there in your outline, keep in mind, this is where we get the word fastener. It is something that sticks to something else. Hold fast that which is good. You need to stick to that which is good as found in verse 21. Hold on to it. You know what a lot of Christians do? They hold on to it until there's a problem in their life. They hold on to it till the preacher offends them. They hold on to it till someone uh, at church says something that, that hurts their feelings. They hold on to it. I'm not making a lot of your problems. I'm just telling you, you need to learn to hold fast to that which is good regardless of what comes your way. You need to hold on. Listen, I'm, I, I, I watch it, and, and like I said before, it's like watching a movie and that terrible scene of the car crash that you just want them to avoid every time, and it happens every time. And, man, there's nothing like I'll never forget. I was going on I-25 North a couple years ago. We were on deputation. And I was coming up to see a church up here uh, to show our ministry. And I'm driving I-25. There's not a lot of traffic. It's a Sunday. And, but it's a little icy on the roads. And I'm behind this person probably about 100 feet. And I'm driving behind this person. And I watch him. And I, I just see him start to do this. And I'm watching from a distance. And I go, okay, time to shift down. And I'm going a little bit slower. And all of a sudden, I see it going like this. And I'm going, Lord, no, 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 no. This is bad. This is bad. Nothing you can do to stop it. And all of a sudden, before you know it, it's bam, going about 60 miles an hour right into that embankment, left shoulder. 
And boy, that was a terrible thing to watch. And you know what the worst part is? Couldn't stop it. You know what's hard as a pastor? Watching other Christians go out of control. And they miss one church service, and they miss two, then they miss three, then they miss four, and before you know it, bam! Now, listen, I, I know it's not all about whether you're at church. I get that, but I'm telling you, the Lord will test you, and He'll test it in a way that's manifest in your life by whether you stay in church, or whether you stay in your Bible, whether you stay on your knees through tough times. Hold fast to that which is good. Guys, I'm going to say this, and, and I'm going to say it graciously, but we're spoiled rotten. And there are Christians that wish they could come to church three times a week. There are Christians in this world that wish they could open up a Bible in public. They wish they could stand on a street corner where they live and give out the gospel of Jesus Christ to whoever walks by. And they can't. And we come to church, well, you don't know what's going on in my life. I don't. I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm not trying to make fun of you. I'm not trying to make light of your troubles. I'm just telling you, whatever you're going through, there are people that wish they could step in your shoes. Why? Listen, hold fast to that which is good. Hold on to it. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1. If you find a place where you can get the Bible taught to you, you can learn the Bible, and you can fellowship with other believers, hold on to it. And I'm not saying this is the only church. I, I, I'll tell you this. There have been other, uh, Christians that move away, and I say, listen, find a good church. You say, why? It's invaluable in your life. It's invaluable to your family. It is invaluable to your marriage. You take yourself out of church for a month, and you see how you walk with the Lord. Take yourself out of church and out of your Bible for a month and see what your marriage is like. And see what your family is like. It's going to be different and it ain't going to be better. All right? And so my point this morning is this. Hold on. Hold fast to that which is good. 2 Timothy chapter 1, look at verse 13. Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. You are told, number 57, to hold fast to the form of sound words, as found in 2 Timothy 1.13. Do you have it in your Bible? All right, hold on to it. Do you have it at your church? Hold on to it. Wherever you can find the form of sound words, hold on to it. Don't let it go. You know what the Bible says in the Old Testament? Buy the truth and sell it not. You know what that means? When you got it in your hands, don't let it go. Let me, I'll say it to you like this in light of that verse. Everyone in here has a price tag. Everyone. There is something that I could be tempted with that wouldn't bother you a bit. And there are things that you could be tempted with that wouldn't bother me a bit. And my point is this, and it's just to hold fast. When that temptation, when that thing comes your way, rather than saying, yeah, I'll sell it, I'll get rid of it, man, hold on to it and don't let it go. All right? Hold fast the form of sound words. Hold fast to that which is good. Can I say this practically? If you've got a saved husband or wife, hold on to them. You got kids that are saved, man, hold on to them. Uh, people are very lax with the things that God has given. Hold fast that which is good. You got Christian marriage, hold on to it. Not everybody has that. Well, you know my spouse, and I don't know you either. I always love that. You know, you don't know what I'm going My spouse is like, well, I'm guessing you're not heaven on earth either sometimes. <laughs> but you're told to hold on to it. Hold fast that which is good. Go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Got to hurry. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, look at uh, verse number 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Mm. Mm. Let me say this, number 58 in your outline says, verse 22 in our passage gives instruction that the modern Christian has a problem with because the modern Christian is more focused on individual liberties. I've got my rights. I've got my liberties in Christ. Individual liberties rather than the edification of others. If what you're going to do, if where you're going to go, and what you're going to say is not going to help somebody draw closer to Jesus Christ, you may want to consider not going, not saying, not doing. You say, well, I can't. I won't lose my salvation. I understand that. You've got liberty in Christ. I get that. But when you put your liberty above the edification of other Christians, you become carnal. And when you put your liberties above that, you know what that shows? It shows God that you're not in this for others and you're not in this for Him. You're in this to see how far you can get with the world and still hold on to Jesus. That's not how this is intended to go. He says, abstain from all appearance of evil. Let me say this in that your outline, number 58, it's not about what something is, but how it appears. There are some things that are not in and of themselves bad, but boy, they appear wrong. <laughs> 
And, and I'll tell you what I heard a preacher illustrate years ago. He's got a guy ruffling through his sock drawer, and he says, Honey! And she goes, What are you yelling about? You ever been home like that, you know? And, uh, and, she, and he goes, Well, I can't tell if my socks are clean or dirty. I, I, I don't know if they're, you know, he's doing the smell test. And, and, and let me tell you something. If, if they're dirty, I know they're dirty. Amen. I can smell them, and okay, they're gone. They go back in the laundry basket. I, mean, I can't tell if they're clean or if they're dirty. She says, Honey, if it's doubtful, it's dirty. Listen, as a Christian, if it's doubtful, stay away from it. Stay away from it. You know, I, I've heard all the different reasons why this particular thing is not wrong and you can do it. And, and, and let me say this. The big thing that a lot, a lot of people, a lot of Christians struggle with this. And listen, if you're not saved and you never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you drinking, you smoking weed, you killing someone, that's child's play. That's not the problem. The problem is your sins haven't been paid for yet. And you're going to go to hell forever and eternity. So I'm not talking to lost people when I say this. Well, I'm, I'm talking to saved people. Saved people will say things like this. Well, I don't think it's all that much of a problem to, to drink a glass of wine from now and then. Now, I'm not, gonna, I'm not even going to get on that message right now, but here's the thing. When you're drinking and you're sitting there at the bar, I guarantee you no one's thinking, boy, whatever they have in their life with Jesus, I want that. You say, why? Because you're just like them. You're soothing the pain just like they do. Listen, I don't know about you. You may hate your job. I actually like my job. I like my job quite a bit. I like both my jobs. I like all three of my jobs. I love them all. All right? But you may hate yours, and I'm sorry if you do. There are people that go, I can't wait till Friday. I look at them and go, get a different job. Amen. Well, I just, you know, I live for the weekend. Listen, if that's you as a child of God, I understand. Look, I like going home. I like being with my family. I like time off. That's good. But if you're that person that has to inoculate yourself from the realities of life by drinking or smoking something or taking this or doing that, there's something that may not be right. And, and what I'm saying is this, that's how the world deals with their issues. Let's not follow suit. Abstain from not all evil, but all appearance of evil. All right? I call messages that have to do with this crowd pleasers. You say, why? Because no one likes them. Amen. <laughs> Romans 14. Look there with me if you would. Romans 14. You know what you like to hear? Well, you're saved, you can do what you want. That's not, that's not biblical. L look, you, can, you, you will not lose the Holy Spirit. We've already talked about that. But you can quench Him and you can grieve Him. And we've looked at that this morning. If you're saved. Romans 14, look at verse number 16. Alright, Romans 14, number 59, your outline. Clearly, you're not going to get through the chapter. That's okay. Rather go through it and take time. Right? Romans 14, number 59, your outline. Romans 14, 16 reminds us that even our good can be spoken against if we're not careful in how things appear. Romans 14, 16 reminds us even our good can be spoken against if we're not careful in how things appear. You ever said a joke to somebody at church and there's someone else there that doesn't really understand the inside joke and they took it as something totally different and you may think that's a small thing. I'm just saying you just got to be careful even with what you say sometimes. Even when you're innocent because sometimes what appears to be a certain way isn't that way to somebody else. All right? Romans 14, 16. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. You know what he's talking about in that passage of Scripture? You can eat whatever meat you want to. But he's talking about a weaker brother's conscience who looks at that meat and knows that, that meat was offered to idols, and he says, look, let not your good be evil spoken of. All right? Uh, the point is this. You need to look at what not just something is, but how it appears to the people around you. You say, why? Because your life is like a letter that's written... And, and God is writing that letter so the outside world can look at it. And the goal and the hope is for them to see Jesus Christ as the theme of your letter. And you don't want to do anything that distracts or detracts from him being the center. And when you go, well, I still think I can do this. I've got the liberty. Okay, he's no longer at the center than you are. And so the idea is this. We want to get beyond just thinking about ourselves. Get beyond that and get to a place where we go, you know what? As much as I'd like to do that, and it's not in and of itself wrong, I, I just don't think I want to be found there because it could appear the wrong way to some of these people, and I don't want to be a stumbling block to them. L listen, I'm going to tell you what. I'm just going to leave it like this, and I'll move on. We'll, we'll get to the last uh, point in the outline and be done for it for the day. Uh, I, you know what? I, I eat out. There are times where you go to a restaurant, and the only place left is at the bar. Do what you want. I'm not going to condemn you for sitting at the bar. I'm just going to tell you, even if you drank water and you had a burger if some person you've been witnessing to and talking to about jesus christ walks in all they're going to see is you're sitting at the bar 
That's just the nature of people. So God tells you to get around that, just abstain from the appearance of evil. I think I've given you this illustration before. One time we're knocking on doors. I think it was in Tennessee, maybe in Pensacola, Florida. I don't remember. A lady comes to the door in a bath towel. She's got a towel wrapped around her, a towel on her head. And, and, and we're t- I was like, oh, hey, well, hello. We're from such and such church. You know, trying to be gracious and not embarrass her. But I'm thinking, why is she not embarrassed, man? You know? And, uh, and so, and so I, I start talking, and she goes, well, you guys can come in. I said, you know, we, we'll come in another time. We'll come in another time. Now, let me ask you a question. If I had gone in her house and I'd given her the gospel, uh, that would have been a good thing, right? Sure. No, don't, don't. This is not a trick question. That's a good thing to give somebody the gospel. Okay? But how would it appear to the community? Guy shows up to someone's house with the Bible and goes in with a woman that has got a towel on. Oh, those dirty preachers. Right? So, you know what you got to do? Learn to abstain from all people. You don't say, you need to get back in there and get some clothes on. I just say, hey, we appreciate it. Very kind and gracious of you. We'll just come back next week. You know? Uh, You say, why? You want to abstain from all appearance of evil. Now, go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I want to at least uh, give you this thought and we'll be done. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It's 11 o'clock, so we'll take about five minutes for a break and some coffee and uh, restroom and fellowship and all that. We'll jump back in around 11.05. All right, uh, verse 23, last point your outline. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 23 discusses the subject, get this, of sanctification. That's a big word, but it means getting cleaned up. All right, it discusses the subject of sanctification, and it's important to understand there's an eternal sanctification that took place at salvation, which refers to your soul. But there's a daily kind that has to be executed through the flesh. The idea is this. Your soul is sanctified. It is clean. It is washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. However, where you live and how you live in the flesh determines how clean you are in this life and how close you can walk with Jesus Christ. And so we'll, we'll look at some more distinctions in regards to that next week. Do we have any questions before we close out? Any questions this morning? Amen.